In the past week, he has brought me to the story of Joseph. How many of you know the story of Joseph? The story of Joseph is, is basically a man that was sold into slavery that became the second in command in Egypt, that God rose up to become the second in command in Egypt. Now let's backtrack a little bit. Joseph's father was Jacob. Jacob's father was Isaac. Are you guys with me? Isaac's father was Abraham. So I just give you a, a lineage there to help you connect the dots. The, the Joseph that I'm talking about came from the lineage of Abraham. You have Abraham that, that, that Abraham and Sarah give birth to Isaac. Then Isaac and Rebekah give birth to Jacob and Esau. Many of you know the story of the two brothers, one deceiving the other, Jacob being known as the supplanter, the conniving one, the deceiver. But yet God has called him to take on the inheritance and take on the blessings and be the one to become Israel. Amen? Then through his loins, he had 12 sons. Now, two sons he had with one woman by the name of Rachel was considered the love of his life. The two sons was Benjamin... Benjamin, and the other was Joseph. The other ten sons, of course, some was from bond servant, but the others was from Leah. Now, I want you to understand something here today before I go into this, and I'm, I'm teaching you some Bible theology. Many of you would look at the, the, the number of sons that Jacob had, and you would say that's all the kids he had. No. He had a few other daughters as well. Only one of them was mentioned in the Bible. But he had many other daughters. Now here is how that works. You see, when in the olden days, the more men you have in your family, the more wealthy you are. Because you have people to supervise and work the fields. You have people to labor and invest in the fields. So in that sense, men used to take on, they have wives, one or two wives, right? We don't practice that today, guys. Just letting you know, right? We don't practice that today. So we have, they had one or two wives. And then out of those wives, they will have children until the day of childbirth is over for those women, right? And what happens is these women, as the head of their family, they're the ones that are married to Jacob, will take their servants and give it to their husbands. And say, give me a son. Now, in this, in this situation here, that's what's been happening. And that's why you have so many sons and so many daughters that men would have in the Bible. Now, how would this happen? Give you a little Bible theology. How many of you are into that? I'll give you a little Bible history. What happens is the woman, the owner or the, the wife of Jacob, let's say Rachel. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Rachel would sit down, right? And then her servant, when the time comes to give birth, will sit on her lap and give birth that way. When this happened, it's a legal um, thing, whereas we sign adoption papers in the United States, is basically saying that that child, although the woman on top, the servant is giving birth to the child, it's not her child. It is the child, and it, the child belongs to Rachel. Now, of course, there will be some prejudices, and there will be some things concerning when you actually give birth to a child versus, you know, you, get a, you take somebody else's child, right? There will always be that. So in this case, you find that Jacob, the Bible says, was in love with Rachel, right? He didn't, he wasn't in love with Leah. He was tricked in a, in a matter of speaking because he had a little bit too much alcohol in his system. And he was tricked to marrying Leah. And then he had to work seven more years. I'm giving you a summary here, guys. Seven more years to gain Rachel. Come on now. Now, what the Bible says is that Rachel was the one he was in love with. And as he was in love with Rachel, he had two sons, out of Rachel, biologically speaking, that she actually gave birth to. Are you guys with me? The first one was Joseph. And the second, as we all read, is called Benjamin. Right? Benjamin was 
the second son that he got from Rachel. Now, Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. You all may not know that, but I'm just giving you a summary. Now, the Bible said that he was, he was very partial to Joseph. What does that mean? It means that Joseph was his favorite son. And in being his favorite son, he would get special attention. He would get special gifts. One of them was, in particular, as we all know, the robe of many colors. Are you with me? The Bible says one day, as jo Jacob sent Joseph to take stuff to his brothers and see what they were up to, that the brothers saw him. Right? And as he was coming towards them, the brothers said to themselves, because of envy in their hearts. Come on, church, are you with me? Now, let me explain what happened. Prior to this incident, and I'm not going to read it because a whole lot of chapters I got to read to get you up to speed. So I'm going to summarize to get you up to speed. Prior to this incident of them catching Joseph, throwing him in a pit, and selling him off to slavery, Joseph had dreams. And the dreams was very prophetic. His father knew they were prophetic, but Joseph, in his youthfulness, did not use wisdom in going and presenting it to his brothers. So what he did was, the first dream, he had a dream that they were all reaping the harvest. And his bundle of straw was standing up in the middle. And his brother's bundle of straws and his mother and father bundle of straws were bowing down to his. All right? And then you, you don't need me to explain what that will do to the other brothers and sisters when you have a dream like that. Then the other dream he had was that he was looking at the stars and, and he was one star and then you have the other star and then you have the moon and so on and so forth. And all of them were bowing down to who? To J Joseph. So this caused what we would call jealousy and insecurity to develop in his brothers. Now let's talk about that for a second. In the church today, we have many that are coming in that are young in the faith. Come on church, I've talked a little bit about this on Wednesday night and I want to elaborate on it here today. They are young in the faith. They are excited about God. They want to do great and mighty things for God. But in the process... They may not do everything as a mature Christian would do. What am I saying? They may not use wisdom in some of the things that they're saying, just like Joseph did. They may not use wisdom in the way they carry about themselves, just like Joseph did. And in a way, you have the older brothers and sisters in the church that would look at them and say, who do they think they are? Who do they think they are? They think they are better than us because they just came in and start receiving all these blessings from God. They think they are more worthy of God's grace than we are. And they start to, in one way, start to meditate on these negative thoughts because of what? Jealousy and insecurity. Now, am I saying that Jacob, Joseph was right in how he presented the word or the dream to his father and his brothers? Nay. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is, as a young believer in Christ, they can do that and have an extension of grace. The reason I'm saying is they're still learning. The same way a parent would extend grace to a baby versus grace to an, a teenager is the same way we as a body of Christ need to extend grace to the believers. When they first walk in the church versus if they've been a, a, a Christian for 20, 30 years. Are you guys with me here today? So in that scenario, you find that Christians would gossip about their loved ones now, and i'm talking about their brother and his sister one because the brother and this sister may look a little bit more talented than they are or they may have a robe of many colors in other words they may have favor with certain individuals or may appear to have favor with god right that's that's how it operates and so insecurity steps in and you start thinking to yourself who do they think they are Jealousy creeps in and you start thinking of yourself, who do you think you are? 
And what that means is when you allow yourself to nurture those ideas and those thoughts, it causes you eventually to act the part. And you may not know it. You may not even know that you have something wrong with you. You may not even know that your face turns sour like a lemon when you see this individual. But it does show. Because why? From the abundance of the heart, if you spend your time meditating upon jealousy and being insecure about your position rather than nurturing someone else to grow and to develop in the faith, what happens is, it shows. So in this instance, we find that Joseph brothers develop jealousy, envy, insecurity towards the brothers, and rightfully so. Let me, let me go into that a little bit. In the olden days, the oldest son is the one that carry on the blessing. It's the oldest one that is respected. It's the oldest one that is treated with favor. Come on now. It's the one that's, let me take it a step further. It's the one that's been there longer. It's the one that's been laboring harder. It's the one that's been a Christian longer will, by most cases, be shown favor. But in this situation, we find that Jacob showed favor to who? To Joseph. He was not the youngest, but he was the one just before the youngest. And he was shown special favor. And the Bible says that because of this, it caused insecurity. Now, I need you to understand something. Isn't that what the prodigal son experienced? The Bible talks of him returning home. And his father said, put a robe on him. Put sandals on his feet and a ring on his finger. And above all, they start to kill, they kill the fatted calf and they rejoice because this man has come home. He's been lost, but now he's found. The one who is there laboring and in the kingdom of God start looking and saying, how dare you kill a calf for him? You never did that for me. Why you never give me a robe? Why you never give me a ring? Why you never put a sandals on my feet? So jealousy and insecurity comes in. May I suggest to you that that is something that happens in the church as well. Now, to be honest with you, I don't see that in abundant life. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I don't see it. Is it there? It may be. Is it now festering or now developing in the hearts of individuals? Maybe. But that is why when we preach the holistic word of God, the word of God is going to address things that need to be addressed before it gets out of control. We as a body of Christ got to be loving. The Bible says these two great, these two commandments I leave with you. Number one is you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Right? That's the one. Number two is you love your neighbor as yourself. Too many times as Christians, we come to church, we speak in tongues, we lift our hands, we pray, and we are, we're the holiest thing on the block. But we do not know how to love. And what we don't realize is God says, tongues will cease, prophecy will cease, everything will cease, but love will never cease. Where faith, love, and hope abound, and I'm giving you scriptures here, the greatest of these, the Bible says, is love. So as much as we desire the gifts of the Spirit, as much as we desire to function in the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the, the, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, as much as we desire for all those things to function in our church, and we want to see God move in His power and presence, we need to keep in mind that God is more interested in are you being His hands and feet in loving those that needs to be loved? Or are you judging and condemning and criticizing just because whatever your reason is? We have to be careful as a church that we do not practice. Am, am I saying that this will never happen? It may happen. We're human beings. We're going to be susceptible to the, to the, to the, 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 the darts, the fiery darts of the enemy. But here's the thing, and I'm going to divert a little bit. When you become a Christian, it doesn't say that you are 
how should I say, problem proof? That you will not have any issues? That you will not have any difficulties or temptation in the flesh? No, it never said that. But here's the thing. When you become a Christian, your mindset changed to where you know those things are possible, but then you also know greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Are you with me? So when these feelings come, and you are having these feelings towards your brother, towards your sister, I want to make something very clear to you. It is not of God. It is of one source and one source only. It is of the devil. The Bible says the devil come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I know a lot of pastors, they don't like to talk about these things on the pulpit. They wait until it gets out of hand or gets become a problem, and then they address it. But as the Holy Spirit put in my heart, I want to talk about things that needs to be addressed right now. Am I saying this is something that we're going through as a church? No, as I said before, I haven't seen it. Is it possible that it'll show up? Possible. But guess what? I believe in equipping, equipping the saints of God. So if it does show up, they hear, the pastor just preached that word. And I'm not going to let the devil whisper in my ear about my brother and my sister. I don't care if they're perfect. I don't care if they're not perfect. I don't care if they don't have it all together. My role on the face of this earth is not to be their judge. My role on the face of this earth is to be their friend, to be their brother, to love them. And the Bible says, love covers a multitude of sin. Can we give the Lord a round of applause? A simple word, but so powerful. The Bible says he went to his brothers, and his brothers said of themselves, let us kill him. I'm going to say that again. Envy and jealousy, you may not kill somebody physically, but the Bible says if you have anger in your heart, you are a murderer. Come on, church. God's standards are not our standards. Sometimes we think we come to church and we're preaching and singing and me as well, included. And we're safe and secure. But God says, that don't impress me. Are you constantly coming to my throne, bringing and the things that need to be brought to the altar? What am I talking about? Am I talking about, oh, all these gifts? No, I'm talking about, are you coming to the throne of God and say, Lord, I have this problem of jealousy. I have this problem of addiction. I have this problem of lust. I have this problem of anger. I have this problem. And Lord, I'm asking you, help me, help me, help me. But be careful. Because when you say, God, help me, the only way he can help you is, <laughs> is to bring things your way that will poke at that area in your life. And when he does it, he's not doing it because he wants to test how weak you are and show you that you are weak. No, he wants to show you areas in your life that, hey, you don't have it all together yet. In fact, you will never have it all together. You got to constantly work out your salvation in fear and in trembling. Before you point your fingers at others, pulling out the, sp the, the plank, out of your own eye is a priority before pulling out the speck out of your brother's eyes. <clears throat> but we need to talk about these things. Come on, church. We need to talk about these things. It's not the five steps to prosperity. It's not a philosophical, psycholo psychological message. It is the Word of God. Simple, straightforward Word of God. And as we glean off of it, read it, digest it. It's going to help us to be the Christians that God wants us to be. In other words, be the followers of Jesus Christ as he's called us to be. Isn't it funny that the one thing he said in the book of Revelations, he said, many will say of me, I cast out demons. I preached. I went to abundant life faithfully. 
I'm not judging anybody. I'm just showing you what the scripture says. I did this for my neighbor. I helped them fix their kitchen faucet. I mowed their lawn. All those things are good now. Don't get me wrong. But then Jesus will say to them, be cast into outer darkness, you worker of iniquity, for I know you not. Here is where I will put a pin in it, and I will ask you to think about this. He said, my sheep knows my voice. Let me ask you this question. You say you are a Christian. You think I'm going to talk about the literal voice of God. Do you know his voice? You say you love him. Like Peter said, do you know his voice? He said, my sheep hears my voice only. You see, you, don't, you won't understand what that means until I break it down for you. You see, in the olden days, a shepherd didn't use a sheep dog to herd the sheep. A shepherd, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, here's the thing. A shepherd will raise a sheep to know him. In such a way that when the shepherd speak and give a particular sound, no matter where that sheep is, he come running because he recognized the voice of the shepherd. In our world today, in our lives today as Christians, are you getting to know the shepherd's voice? Because if you don't know his voice, if you don't know what he's saying, you will not be able to restrain yourself from doing things contrary to his voice, to his word. You will always find a way to justify immorality. You will always find a way to justify your actions. You will always find a way to say you have to do what you have to do. But you see, when we come to that place in knowing his voice, we know what hurts him. We know what impresses him. We know what makes him happy. We know what makes him sad. How many of you know what makes him sad? I do. I just have to do one little wrong thing. And my heart is so convicted. If you are here today and you're doing wrong things, you know what those wrong things are. I don't need to preach you down. You know what those wrong things are. And if you are not convicted, you need to come back to the cross and seek God and ask Him to turn. And I'm going to say this word with all love and gentleness. Turn your stony heart into a heart of flesh again. If sin is no longer a bad thing or a wrong thing for you to partake of or do, you need to come back to the cross. Because he says he wants to know you. He wants to know you. You know the other part of the scripture that I love, or in the Bible that I love. He said, if there is one that is lost, sheep, he will go after that one and leave the 99. Why? I want you to think about it. Why? It's just a sheep. But when you understand the shepherd of those days, they built a relationship with the sheep. How many of you have a pet dog at home? <clears throat> Anybody here have a pet dog? Good. And I know that dog means a lot to you guys. Right? You will take care of them. You will take them to get their shots. You will take them to get check if they're sick, to the vet, to get them looked at. All these different things. When you come home, they're wagging their tail and they're going to give you... I can't wag my tail, by the way. I'm just saying. They're wagging their tail, going to give you a kiss or a hug. And, and the fact that they will listen to your voice. When you say no, they will stop. 
You could go on vacation. You come back, boy, and somebody else is looking after them, and you're at the door, and you just have to speak one word, and whoever's taking care of them, they go wild. They're like, oh, he's home. He's home. And even though they've been well taken care of for a week, it's like they miss their master. They miss whatever you call them or they call you. I don't know. But they miss you. Because why? They developed a relationship with you. They will bite everybody else, but they will not bite you. In more cases than one. They would do anything just to make you happy. They would come and lick you on the face. And you guys know what I'm talking about. I've seen it. I've had dogs in the past. One time, back home, well, when we raised dogs, we raised them. I'm getting used to raising dogs as, as like um, knowing everybody. Right? And be nice to everybody because of the possibility of lawsuits. Right? But back home where, where I was raised, America is my home now. Amen? Amen? But where I was raised, I can't curse that bridge. There was a lot of things that was instilled in me there as well. And when you raise a dog, you raise them as watchdogs. Whoever crossed that fence get bitten. No other way. And you want the biggest, baddest dog, short, short tempered dog that you can find. And you will use them as watchdogs. But you, as their master, they would love you, play with you. I was, I'm still short, but I was a little bit shorter then. And I would walk him, his name was Bruzo. He was brown. He was mixed with Pitbull and Doberman. And he was huge. He was huge. And I was so proud because everybody else had little, little dogs. And mine, boy, when we walk, even though I was little, I felt like a giant because Bruzo was right next to me. The guys in the head of the street, they used to come together and hang out at the head of the street. And all the guys would be there and we, I would walk with Bruzo. When I'm walking with Bruzo, every man jack from the car, but they know Bruzo. They jump in across the, um, the little drain and be on the other side. Because they realize this little boy cannot hold Bruzo back completely. I could guide him, but one man told me once, he says, I don't walk my dog. My dog walked me. And I guess that's what the right terminology would be concerning Bruzo. But anytime I leave the home and come back, he would be the first one to greet me. Everybody else is busy doing their own thing. He's wagging his tail and maybe looking to see if I could bring anything for him. And I know I'm talking about a dog, but I'm building something here for you to understand. The sheep. In olden days, when they were raised by their shepherd, they were raised with a relationship with their shepherd. Not like how you see the sheep dogs herding the sheep now. And the sheep, the master or the shepherd would make a sound and the sheep would hear it. And they would come running back to where the master is. My question to you is, do you know the master's voice? The great I am, the great master put under shepherds over you. Do you know your shepherd? And yes, I'll say my name. I'm not putting my name out there as a, a thing, but I'm teaching you the word of God. Do you know the shepherd that is shepherding you here today. Are you just here because you feel a little bit of goosebumps? Are you willing to submit under that shepherd? You see, the way the great I am, the great shepherd speaks is, yes, he speaks to you and you know his voice personally, but also he speaks through the shepherd. The one that loves his sheep. You may look at me and you say, how in the world can you love me? You have no clue. 
My wife asked me, what are some of the things this morning that stresses you out? Because I rubbed my hand on my hair and a couple hair fell out. <laughs> it literally fell out. I was like, what in the world is going on here? And I was there and she said, what? You know, out of concern. Because hair loss is some form of stress, I guess. And she asked me, what is stressing you out? In the moment... You know what I could think about? And I'm not saying it's stress. It's more of I'm concerned. What's happening to my abundant life belief? Are they doing okay? You won't believe how many times your name come across in my mind. And I'm thinking about you and I'm saying, God, I may not pray, Oh, Shabba, 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 and bind every demon on your life. I, I may not do that. But in that moment, I'm like, God... Help them. Amen. Be their friend. In times of loneliness, that they need you. Be there for them. When I cannot be there, be there for them. We're living in a different time where I can't, ju I can't just stop into people's houses. But I'm asking you, the Father, the Great Father, the Great Shepherd, the one that loves them more than anything else in this world, go where they're at, in their room right now where they're crying, where they're hurting, where they need somebody to embrace them. And I want to embrace them. But God, I know your embrace is better than mine. You may never understand how much I love you when you walk through those doors. Because the word of God says I will have to give an account. You don't know this. Until I tell somebody this yesterday. There are many pastors that are hired. But not many are called anymore. Many are hired. When churches need a pastor, they look for one that had experience and they go bringing him in, not caring if the man have a vision for the church or have a vision for the people there or have a vision for the community. When I came here, I didn't come to Pelzer because, oh, I had some big apartment buildings that I could go witness toward the population like they do now in church work to bring people into the house of God. No, I came to Pelzer because I saw drug houses on every street corner and I said, God, they need you. They need the love of Jesus. And I say I want to go if you would send me I want to go I didn't go because of the money I don't get paid from abundant life but I come here because I love this people and I love this community because we are here if you are to do what I'm saying you got to first see me do it Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what is the other one? Love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says, in closing, another time I'll continue. There's so much I could bring out from that little piece. The Bible says he went. And because the brothers didn't feel that love, they loved it's not that they didn't love him. They allow jealousy. They allow envy. They allow all these things to take that place. And when they're talking to people, they don't realize it. But people can feel their jealousy and people can feel their hate. And the people, instead of feeling the embrace of Jesus, they're like, man, Jesus don't want me. I was talking to some people yesterday and sometimes when I, when I think, I said, man, I wish I could catch some of those pastors and backslap them till I miss. And I know that sounds mean, but it's so true. Pastors have prostituted the word of God. We think we're here to be served. No, we are here to serve. We are here to wash the feet of others. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you don't get down on your knees, if you don't let me wash your feet, Peter, you have no place with me. That's why when Cole want to go out and see the community, I make sure I'm there. I make sure I'm sweating just as much as the person next to me. Because I am here to serve, not to be served. My reward is going to come. Yes, I want to see God do it here. I want to see God do great things here. But it's going to come when I go to heaven. Where moth, rust, or dust cannot take away.
In closing, I ask you this. Jealousy causes brothers, and yes, God, turn it around. And you may say, oh, but if that didn't happen, he wouldn't end up being second to the Pharaoh or to save the people. Maybe all that is true. But let's look at the very literal sense of what jealousy, envy, bitterness, anger towards your brothers and sisters in Christ can cause. It's not that you don't love them. I believe they loved them. I believe after they did what they did, their life was filled with regret. But it was too late. But they allow envy, hate, and bitterness to crowd their heart. And in doing so, it causes them to act the part. They sell him as a slave. And yes, God turned it around to where that same Joseph ended up saving the life of his family. But I'm here to ask you, are you willing to say, God, remove every hate from my heart? You may be here today trying to figure out whether church is for you or not. Maybe somebody hurt you. Somebody done something to you. Is that why we serve God? As much as I love every one of you, do you know that I don't come here for you? I'm going to say it. I, I want you to know I love you, but I don't come here for you. You are not with my eyes is on because when one of you show up, my heart will melt like crazy. And then I got to keep my eyes on God and say, God, I'm here for you. Fill these pews with angels. Fill these pews. And I'm going to preach to that one like if I'm preaching to thousands. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it to be mean. I'm here to tell you. When you come to church, you don't come because of your mother. You don't come because of your father. You don't come because of your brother, your husband, whatever the case may be. You come because you want God. You want to be among the people of God. You want to do your part in encouraging someone in the things of God. Can we stand to our feet? Folks, I need you to understand the kingdom of God is a beautiful thing. But why are we here? Are you here to serve Him? Or can you only, when you come to church, you're thinking back about the time somebody in church hurt you? I can't promise you that that will never happen here, but I'm praying and believing that God would help us to nip things, cut them out before it even starts. Amen. That abundant life will truly be known as a church that loves. Yes. Not just the church that prophesies, not that the church that lay hand on the sick and see them recover, but one thing I desire to be known for is love because the Bible says this is the greatest in the kingdom of God. We have some men here, and God is going to use you guys. But I still feel like we are holding back. I'm asking you today. I'm asking you today. If you would give and surrender your life, not just in the terms of salvation, but I'm talking about surrendering your time, surrendering you. And say, God, you come first, not me. Then I promise you, you will gain everything else. You will gain everything else. You will gain that loving wife. You will gain those loving kids. You will gain them. Yes, they will stomp their toes, but you will gain them. I pray for you today the blessings as God will put upon me to bless you. May your lives be blessed, every one of you, men and women, boy and girl. May your lives be blessed in your going out. May your life be blessed in your coming in. May your life be lifted up when others try to pull you down. 
May you see the favor of God in everything that you put your hands to do. May God use you to start businesses and bless it. May God elevate you in your workplace and bless it. May God keep your heart from surrendering to pride and keep your heart humble before Him. And may you know always that the love of Jesus knows no bounds. It's not limited. As a matter of fact, it's limitless. It is so powerful. And all you got to do is when you make a mistake is come back to the arms of Jesus. And with that said, I want to open this altar here today. Is there anybody that needs, that feel in their heart, they need to recommit their life back to Jesus? Church has hurt you. Life has hurt you. It has even ca caused you to, to condemn yourself and, and criticize and, 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 and even say, God, you're not real. If you were real, you wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me. With every eyes closed and every head bowed, I would like to give that opportunity for someone to come up here and accept Jesus again. Recommit their lives back to Jesus. Saying, Lord, I'm not perfect, but I am making the step to, in the right direction today. And if you would be bold enough to do so, I would be willing to pray with you. Glory be to God.